Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ayo Kohli. I'm a professor of comparative literature and African and African American studies. I'm also the chair of the program in African and African American studies. On behalf of the Dickey Center for International Understanding and the program in African and African American studies, I would like to welcome you to this lunchtime conversation on the topic of decolonization in the 21st century. Our program this afternoon will be recorded um, and posted on the YouTube channel of the Dickey Center um, in the coming days. For the first part of our program, our two guests, our two scholars will be in conversation and we will take questions from the audience in the second half of this program. So you may submit your questions using the Q&A function. Now to our two speakers and scholars of decolonization, and I will proceed in alphabetical order in my introduction. Uh, first, Professor Eman Morsi uh, of Dartmouth College. Professor Morsi studies modern Arab and Latin American literary and cultural production with special focus on the mid 20th century. Her scholarly interest, but also her many publications engage with questions in the field of post-colonial and decolonial studies, third world studies, comparative literature, trans area studies, utopian studies, political philosophies, food studies, feminist theory, and embodiment studies. Her current book project uh, is titled Utopia Incarnate, Everyday Consumption in the Body in Cuba and Egypt. 1950s, 1990s. And this book traces ubiquitous tropes of embodiment across diverse literary and artistic works during and after the creation of the socialist states of Cuba and Egypt. Um, Professor Morsi aims here to explicate the paradoxical cultural legacies of the institutionalized revolutions of the mid 20th century. At Dartmouth, uh, Professor Morsi uh, is affiliated with, uh, is appointed in the program in Middle Eastern studies, but also she has affiliations with comparative literature, women and gender studies. Um, she also teaches uh, for the Department of Theater. And I hope, and Latin American studies also, Latin American studies, I should not have. A lot of programs. Before. Sorry? Oh, I was joking, it's a lot of programs, yes. Well, <laughs> It, it, it speaks to your, you know, your work, right? Um, <laughs> then we have Professor Sabelo Ndlovu Gacheni. Uh, professor Ndlovu Gacheni is professor and chair of epistemologies of the global south with emphasis on Africa at the University of Bayreuth in Germany. He previously held appointments at the University of South Africa and the University of Johannesburg also in South Africa. Professor Ndoglu Gacheni is um, a leading decolonial theorist who has published extensively in the fields of African history, African politics, African development, and decolonial theory. He is the author of many defining books for this field. Um, and I'm just going to list some of the books. Uh, that I have and I can see in my home library now. Empire, Global Coloniality and African Subjectivity, Coloniality of Power in Post-Colonial Africa, <clears throat> the Decolonial Mandela, Decolonization, Knowledge and Development in Africa, and Epistemic Freedom in Africa, which my class is also reading now. Um, again, thank you again, Iman you. and Fabello. And uh, the floor is now yours. Well, um, Sabella, I want to uh, second Ayo's comments about that we're looking forward to having you on campus in the future, and mm -hmm. where we, where um, you know, I could pick your brain about decolonization, especially epistemological decolonization in detail. Mm -hmm. For today's purposes, um, our main audience are, are our undergrad students and alumni, and a lot of them are still learning about African history and mm -hmm. the context in which um, 
we're speaking. So I'm going to start with the first question, which is, what is decolonization? When did it happen? No, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Eman, uh, for, for this conversation. And uh, thank you for the invitation to, to share my ideas on uh, this topical issue of, uh, of decolonization. Um, I, I must say that uh, perhaps it will make more sense to, 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 <clears throat> to lay a background so that we understand decolonization in its complexity and uh, in its deeper forms. And uh, that means we need to know what, what is colonialism in the first instance. <clears throat> and uh, the two are both very expansive concepts uh, which, 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 which have a planetary uh, <clears throat> uh, implications. So if we start with the trying to understand uh, colonialism, and the best de definition uh, for me of colonialism, I think comes from Achille Mbembe. And when he speaks about uh, the desire for the colonialists to claim the earth as their own. Uh, in other words, to conquer it. Uh, and when we are talking about conquering it, we mean conquering the people, conquering nature, conquering almost all aspects of life uh, so that it is subjected to colonial power. So there's, 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 there's really a very expansive uh, understanding of what colonialism is because it conquers human beings, it conquers land, it conquers space, it conquers uh, nature, it conquers almost all aspects of human life and the subject is to colonial power. And the, such a force is actually pitched at a planetary scale. And, uh, and when we trace it, we trace it as far back as the 15th century. Uh, and uh, when we trace it to that time, the interesting part is that the decolonization also kicks in immediately, colonization kicks in. There is nobody who accepted to be colonized, people resistant from the beginning. And uh, it is a, a background in the sense that before the actual physical colonization, there were other processes which, which actually enabled and softened, particularly Africa, uh, before it was colonized. And the such processes as the enslavement of, of African people and their shipment as a cargo across the Atlantic Ocean to work in the plantations and the mines in the Americas. And uh, that actually is part and parcel of an enabling event for colonization of, of, of Africa. Um, and uh, therefore, when we think about decolonization, we need also to pitch it at a planetary scale. If the colonialists claimed uh, the earth as their own, and they tried to make everyone a foreigner on earth, uh, and themselves becoming the, the natives of the earth, therefore the decolonization challenges that notion, and it claims that the earth belongs to all of us. That is at a, at a, at a, at a, at a planetary scale. But because I said that colonialism also subjects all aspects of our lives to colonial power. I think the other issue which we need to say is that decolonization is a multifaceted uh, a phenomenon in the sense that it wants to undo what colonialism has done in terms of the subjection of human beings to colonial power. And that subjection of human beings to colonial power takes the form of what we call coloniality of being, whereby human populations are actually classified, uh, socially classified and racially hierarchized uh, so that there are some who are pushed to the lowest echelons of the social invented social pyramid and the others are pushed up. And those who are pushed down, they are the ones who are targeted for colonization, for enslavement and even for genocides. So that's, that's one aspect, but it also subjects knowledge to colonial power to the extent that <clears throat> only knowledge from Europe and from North America becomes the only knowledge which is acceptable. And the other knowledges of the other parts of the world are actually pushed to the periphery and to the margins. So 
again, decolonization actually comes in there to try to liberate those knowledges, which to use uh, Michel Foucault's terminology, subjugated knowledges. So it also, it also <clears throat> subjects people to power itself, to raw power, whereby you come, you evade, you dispossess, and then you inscribe colonial power in other people's spaces. And again, the decolonization is about undoing that which is aspect of de or political decolonization. So it's a, it's a multifaceted uh, 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 movement uh, of resisting colonization in its multiple uh, subjections of, uh, of aspects of human life to, to colonial power. And, uh, and uh, as such, we can't actually speak about it in terms of a singular definition because there are various ways through which people have resisted. The enslaved people have become actually the first people to resist from the time of capture to the time of transportation to the time of subjugation in the, in the plantations, they are resisting throughout. And they, one of the earliest uh, movements of resistance is the Haitian revolution of 1791 to 1804, which actually forms a basis of how people can fight against enslavement, racism, and the colonial domination. So again, in terms of when do we trace it from, it depends which space you are looking at, because the, the, the area which is now today called the Americas uh, is the earliest which is subjected to Spanish and the, and the Portuguese colonialism. Then it moves to Asia and the British and the French then come in and then it moves to Africa. So you will need to really understand it in these different zones. And what is also important about understanding this subjection to colonialism is that we are subjected to colonialism unevenly and differentially, depending on the stations in which they created for us within the power structures. So that also needs to be taken into account. Yeah, thank you for the answer, I guess. So my next question would be, so a stereotypical, I guess a very simplistic narrative mm -hmm. of decolonization would be, you know, all of these continents, uh, which at one point were known as the third world, now we refer to them as the global south, were colonized by various European empires. Yep. Then, um, especially in the continent of Africa, they were split up randomly based on em imperial colonial interests into mm -hmm. nation states. Mm. Uh, that were subjugated to um, colonial rule, but then we have the 20th century and mid 20th century decolonization happens and decolonization means political mm. uh, national um, nation states emerge, national independence, we have mm. the bandum, etc. Mm. So the question is, why, so this was all happening in the 50s and we have, you know, through, sorry, from World War II through the mm -hmm. 60s. Mm -hmm. And now, um, as far as many people will come to you and say, colonialism has over, decolonizing mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. over, we have independent nation states. Mm -hmm. The question would be, so why are we still talking about it in the 21st century? Again, I will, I will go back to say, we need to have a deeper understanding of what colonialism is. Because if we don't have that, then we will think that colonialism is over. I think colonialism, the, in trying to, for analytical purposes, I will try to think about the empires maybe in three categories. The physical empire, which comes, invades, dominate people. And that one we no longer have uh, because that is the one which was dismantled after 1945. But we, the empire had other, other, other aspect to it, which for lack of a better term, I will talk about the cognitive aspects of the empire, whereby it invades the mental universe of a people and it imposes particular ways of knowing and the particular forms of consciousness. That does not evaporate with the dismantlement of the physical empire. Then there is a third dimension to it, which is the commercial economic, uh, 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 aspects of the empire, whereby it takes control of the economies of the third world or the global south, <clears throat> as, as, as you described it. 
And that, again, as we learn from the work of Nkwame Nkrumah in 1965, particularly his book on neo-colonialism, the, the, the last stage of imperialism, you, you will then realize that a country or a continent can gain political independence. In quotation marks, we must always put in quotation marks, political independence without necessarily gaining economic freedom. And we must add without necessarily also gaining uh, epistemological freedom. And what we are witnessing now, the afterlives, if I can use that, the afterlives of colonialism is what we are grappling with today. And we are grappling with that under uh, the term from the Latin American theories, the term coloniality, which means that the, 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 the Colonialism as a system of power, not as an event, as a system of power, actually survives the dismantlement of the empires. And the, because of that, we see the relations which are colonial-like after the dismantlement of the direct colonial administrations. And the, because of that, we then escalate our analysis to say, but what is colonialism? Is it an event which started in 1884 in Africa and the perhaps ended in 1960 for most of the <clears throat> for most of the continent? And the answer is if we are do, talking that like that, we are only talking about one aspect of colonialism, which is the direct uh, colonial administration. And the, the, the response to that becomes political decolonization. That there is almost a consensus that the empires are no longer there we shifted from empires to nation states. But again, we need to sophisticate uh, our argument in that area, in the sense that the, 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 what we call political decolonization is again very problematic in the sense that these countries which were said to have gained political independence were being invited into the same system which they were fighting against. So they were being invited into the modern world system through the United Nations organization. And the, the, the issue is, you must understand that this modern world system is a very clever system in the sense that when anti-colonial forces confront it, it reacts. And it reacts in a very interesting way. One, it reacts by eliminating the anti-systemic the anti, the anti, uh, forces. But most often is not elimination it actually disciplines and accommodates in the same system. So we need to be, to always qualify political independence. What did it mean? Did it mean the system of power which emerged in the 15th century was changed? The answer is no, it was not changed. The, 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 what became the third world was invited into the same system and into the lowest echelons of it. Uh, even when they joined in numbers, the United Nations, you will find that they don't have a veto power. So they are a quantity in the United Nations, but at the same time, their voice is still a minority voice. So, so we, we need to, to get that clear. Then the second aspect, particularly the economic aspect, colonialism created particular forms of economies in where they, they dominated. And they created economies which are outside looking, economies which actually serve Europe and North America. And those economies, even if you remove a direct political ad colonial administration, they remain outside looking, still servicing the, 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 global, the powerful global North in terms of supply of raw materials and then importing uh, uh, the finished products. And in such a situation, that's when Kwame Kuma becomes right to say there is neo-colonialism. In other words, an independent state without independent economic determination of its, of its, destiny, its destination. Then we are adding now in the 21st century another dimension, which is very important. And that is the dimension of the epistemological, the knowledge that empire also colonizes uh, knowledges of other, wherever it dominates, and it imposes its own knowledges, including languages, including cultures. And those don't actually evaporate 
with the removal of direct political ad colonial administration. And this is why, therefore, we're talking about decolonization today. And they were talking about decolonization today, specifically the epistemological decolonization, because we realize within the institutions of higher learning, particularly the universities, you will find that the culture is still Eurocentric. Even if the universities are given native names or, or local names or something like that, the curriculum is still dominated by writers and the thinkers theory from, from the global north. And they, all that sig signifies to us that colonialism is not over. It is all over to use uh, Walter Mignolo's terminology. Yeah, and I completely agree with you. I think I always say the university will have decolonized when we start having the Department of Nigerian Studies, the way that we have departments of German studies or Italian studies um, in US campuses. Mm. Uh, but this uh, brings me to, um, you know, the book you've written about, um, you know, since we're talking about universities now, about decolonizing the university. Your book title was Decolonizing the University Knowledge Systems and Disciplines in Africa. And you had uh, told me that you've written it while in an administrative position yep. and thinking about the university in South Africa specifically, but in Africa in general as well and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, how do we decolonize the university? I know it's a very big question. But... In fact, in fact, Tim, I had the, 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 the opportunity to be based in South Africa, a, 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 a geopolitical site, which is very unique in the sense that, as you know, <clears throat> the apartheid system, the apartheid colonial system was the most resilient. It was only dismantled in 1994, whereas in Nigeria, it might have been dismantled in the 1960s. And the, when you go into that space called South Africa, you will find that even universities were actually organized in accordance with the rest. You will have English universities for the English speaking people. You will have uh, African universities for the Africaners. Then you have Bantu University or Black universities for the Black people. And the, that was a hierarchical system of hierarchizing universities themselves and they also hierarchizing the entry. Where do you enter? If you are black, you go to the black ones, which were fewer. If you are African, you go to African ones. And if you are English, you go to the English ones. And those are the universities which were inherited by the post uh, apartheid government. And because of that, the English ones, they remain dominated by English culture. The Africans one, they remain dominated by the Africans culture. And the black ones, they also, because they were meant to provide inferior education, it was said that the African people must not be given sophisticated mathematics and the other. So it is that environment which I entered when I came to South Africa, and I found that there was already effort to try and transform them into singular 26 universities in South Africa, trying to make them part of an education system, a singular education system, not one bifurcated by race uh, and even by ethnic races. Because when you are saying Africans and the, and, the, and, the, and the English, these are all white, but they also have their own ethnicity in the, which actually makes them create universities. So that was a very, a very unique situation which I found. And then I found that in the country, there are 11 recognized official languages. But in the universities, either you are using English or Africans. And that also became an aspect to say, if there are 11 official languages, including African indigenous languages, why are they not languages of instruction, of teaching and the research? So that's one aspect which we're trying to change. Then the second aspect which we're trying to change is the issue of the institutional cult. Now, the majority of the students in the universities are actually African, and I mean African Black. But they are entering into universities with the cultures to the extent that at UC, University of, of, of Cape Town, they even confronted the statue of Cecil John Rose, the imperialist is still standing at the center of the university. And they are, 
they feel really very, very insulted to find something like that after the end of colonial apartheid. And they then realize that this, this is symbolic, but the culture is very pervasive across the university. The culture, the European culture in a university which is located in South Africa and the South Africa, which is in Africa. So the issue is how do we change the institutional cultures of the university? Institutional cultures, which are basically patriarchal, sexist, Eurocentric uh, uh, cultures. So again, we had to intervene in that area. Then the, four, the, third, the, 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 the third area, if not the fourth area of intervention, then the other issue, which, 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 which is not uniquely South African, uh, including this issue of institu institutional cultures. If we are going to universities, like we are going to center of civilization, whereby you need to undergo civil, being civilized, you are coming from the barbarian side of society into the center of civilization, whether it's in Nigeria, whether it's anywhere, it is like that, because the universities are inherited of mod modern, Euro-modernity. So there is another aspect which we discovered again, and this is the issue of curriculum. That in terms of curriculum, again, you'll find that in terms of curriculum, Euro, 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 European thinkers, North American thinkers are dominant in the disciplines. For instance, a discipline like sociology, you'll find Max Weber, Kali Marx, uh, Dakim, they are still considered to be the canon. And, uh, and then you ask yourself, but who are these people? Where are they from? Where are they today? And how did they get? all this universalization, they are thinking, how was it universalized? And how relevant is it to an African context, a South African context? And then we begin to also question that. And the, 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 the issues also go to demographics, particularly in the South African context. In Nigeria, you will find that universities, professors are all black or they can be male dominance, but they are black. In South Africa, you'll find even at the professor level, it is still uh, basically white and male. And then the other aspect of change was how do we make sure that also black South Africans come into, 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 into the professorial, into, and they, they, they are mobile within the university structures uh, into lecturer, uh, uh, senior lecturer, associate professor, professor. And all those are part and parcel of how to decolonize the university. But the, the major, even the major part of it, you are doing this inside an institution, is it? But the issue is, what about the institution itself, the very idea of the university itself? It comes from a particular civilization and they, that civilization created a particular university for its own purposes. But now we are saying we are independent, we are post-apartheid. The university needs to serve the agenda of a post-apartheid society and a post-colonial Africa. How do you make them do that? The issue is you might actually realize that on the continent, we are having universities on the continent, but not African universities. Because if they are African universities, they needed to take into account seriously their own location. And ideally, they must have emerged from that location. But most of them, they are a transplant from somewhere. I started at the University of Zimbabwe in Zimbabwe. It is called the University of Zimbabwe, but it emerged as a college of the University of London. And because of that, it is in Zimbabwe. But its culture, its standards, its protocols, its concept of, of excellence are in line with what London wanted. But is that actually of service to Zimbabwe, for instance? So these are the, are the dynamics which we are trying to deal with when we talk about decolonizing a university so that it becomes a home for everyone. It, it, it must not be an institution where when you come to the university, you need to, to undergo a rebirth, you die in order to be reborn as a black European. It, does, it, it needs not to, to, to be like that. But most of, most of the times, it means, therefore, when you are coming to the university, forget your native language, forget your, your indigenous language. By the time you come to the university, you look down at your native language, and you feel like to be educated means to speak English. 
uh, to speak French, to speak Spanish, to speak uh, Portuguese, and therefore that is sign. And then we see that as cultural imperialism. And how do we reverse that? Could you give us some examples of what you did in your administrative position? Um, yeah, of course. There, there, there were many, there were many issues, and they, I think I also left one, one other aspect to connect your current question with the previous one. We were actually then lucky that uh, uh, within the South African context, they imagined the roads must fall and the fees must fall movements, which were spearheaded by the students themselves, and they're making these these demands more loudly and more clearly to the extent that a lot of professors were complacent. They thought we're just teaching is fine because the professors are products of, of a westernized university system. Sometimes they don't see the problem. But with the student movements, we were then put under pressure to really do practical change. I was, I was because of the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the meetings of the roads must fall, Movement. That's when I moved from my position as the head of Achima Fetcher Research Institute to move into the vice chancellor's office to be part of a new unit, which was called the change management unit, whereby you were supposed now to do practical change at a language level, at a curriculum level, institutional cultures. And I was in a unit in which there was an executive director, and I was there as a director responsible for transformation and the decolonization of scholarship. And there was another colleague within the unit who was responsible for institutional transformation. Then there was another colleague who was responsible for changing the systems and the, and the policies. Then there was another one who was responsible for changing the governance structures. And they were talking here, when we talk about governance structures, changing even the idea of academic academic freedom and then you add the element of epistemic freedom which deepens it and it joins the question of of rights with the question of justice and also in that very space you also bring in the element of academic democracy who represent who in the con in the con in the, in the in the committees of the university who sits in the council who sits in the in the in the senate and they were sitting in all these committees. So these are practical issues which we're trying to push forward. Uh, and of course, you are pushing them uh, against a, a very resilient culture. Where some people will say, ah, now we are destroying the university. The university is supposed to be elitist. It is supposed for the talented few. And now we are actually making it opening up for everyone. Then you are destroying the university, you are destroying the standards. And they, we needed to engage the stakeholders. So I spent most of my time engaging the stakeholders to see, to make them see that the issues which we are trying to change are to the benefit of everyone within the university. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree with you. Um, in, in entrenched notions of excellence, I think are the most, the hardest to undo, especially when your own self, a sense of self worth and importance in the academy is part of that those criteria right and i think the difficulty is also compounded by the fact that me and you are a product of the same westernized university so yeah. when we talk about standards that's what we know so mm -hmm. it therefore means that when we are decolonizing it's not about going for institutions and for these other things first is to go for ourselves to transform ourselves into 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 a new force of change because we are products of that so it means it starts with us changing our consciousness of what a university is and what is university education and who is supposed to be in a university so it's basically starts with me and it starts with you in this issue of decolonizing and they start with the changing the consciousness i remember <clears throat> professor ashis nadi saying that which is done in the minds of people must be undone in their minds so that they can actually think differently. So I have a lot of follow-up questions on that point, but I think um, yeah. I'll just ask one more question and then open yeah, it up yeah. to the audience and then we can see depending on audience questions. Yeah. Um, 
So thinking about, okay, decolonizing our own minds and mm -hmm. our worldview, right? So when we think of area studies, for instance, which is very deeply entrenched in the US, the content, continent of Africa is actually split into North Africa, which you know, disappears from the continent and mm. gets lumped into this thing called mm. the Middle East, mm. um, which, you know, every time I hear it, I'm Mideast of what, for whom, right? Mm. And then uh, the rest of Africa is Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. Mm. So, and this is, a, I guess, a selfish question since yeah. it's part of what I'm working on as well mm. as the one who works on North Africa. Mm. How do we bring back so as in the process of decolonization, as a concrete example, for instance, like mm, how mm, do we mm, bring back North Africa to the rest of Africa? How do we think of the continent as a whole? In, yeah. Right? In, fact, in fact, another aspect of decolonization, which is very important, is to rewrite the history. And the rewriting the history means that you go, you go back to correct some of the misrepresentations of, uh, of the history of Africa. If you think it's ironical that today North Africa is said to be part of Middle Eastern, the part of Middle Eastern studies, because the first time the term Africa meant the North Africa, not even Sub-Saharan Africa, and it is surprising that it is that region now which is which is cut out of out of Africa when 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 the Roman Empire had had the colonies there, particularly around Libya and the other areas. That's where they used the concept of Africa which meant that part of the region. So it was the first part to be called Africa with not the sub-Saharan Africa. And it is, it is interesting that it ends up where it is that it is no longer used. It is now used for the area be, below the, 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 the Sahara Desert. So it's important that we, 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 we rethink that and they retell the correct history of saying, but it has always been part. And I, I like the work of, of Al Mazuri where he tried to really come, come heavily on that to say, but he, even even the, the the Sahara Desert was never a boundary. In fact, it was a, a route across. So so, but nowadays we are making it as though it's another boundary for North Africa than Sub-Saharan Africa. But there was always Trans-Saharan trade which connected the North and the South. So there was never a boundary which actually exclude the north and the and the, and the, and the exclude the, the 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 south in this context. So there is need to retell the history properly. And the part of the colonial project is a recovery project. And the, what you recover, you need to recover the histories so that you retell them in a in a different way. And the, once you do that, it can be part of what 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 Ngukuationgo called remembering, because the issue of bringing uh, North Africa and the and the and the Sub-Saharan Africa together is remembering what has been dismembered, and the, what it dismembers before it, it is done uh, physically. Dismembering is first of all done epistemically, so that's why we need to go into the epistemic, into the histories to say where what happened, how did the history got rewritten wrongly to the extent that it then takes part of Africa into 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 the Middle East, and then reduces Africa to to what was called the Sudan, the, the Sudanization of the other part, the area below 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 the Sahara the, the Sahara, the Sahara uh, Desert. So again, it's a matter of really uh, the 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 issue is continentalization itself is a colonial project. <laughs> the issue of continentalization itself. But the, the important part, when we say continentalization was a construction of colonialism, what is, is constructed, it becomes a reality. It is a reality now. <laughs> and uh, as a reality now, we need to then uh, really restore and, uh, and uh, make sure that Africa becomes what it is. Because this division of North Africa into, into a and in the, in the sub-Saharan Africa is a racist a concept. It's a racist concept that some are black, some are relatively light. They are, so it's part and parcel of what I called, I, I talked about, coloniality of being. And because they are lighter, therefore they are. But the Africans are not of the same color, is it? 
<laughs> they have they, they are there are many colors of African people. They are they are not all black. To try to do that is actually to distort the reality of the continent. Um, thank you so much. So I, again, I have so many questions, but for the purposes of the panel, I think <laughs> I'll Pointed. stop there and um, I'll let Ayo take over the Q&A. Thank you so much um, for a great um, conversation. I also have many um, mm -hmm. questions and I'll invite um, the audience to enter uh, their questions using the Q&A uh, button. Mm -hmm. uh, I see a number of questions and I'll read them in the order sure, sure. Uh, that they are appearing. So the first one is, are the post-colonial national borders initially created by the colonialist another mm -hmm. aspect of residual colonialism? Uh, maybe we take about three if possible. Okay. Um, yeah. A second one is, um, what do you believe are the uses and or dangers of decolonization as a trendy metaphor in everyday conversation these days mm -hmm. in higher education and beyond? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Will Cheng, for this question. Um, and then Jessica Yin is asking, how do we decolonize international development and foreign aid to Africa? So mm. you have your three questions. Mm. Uh, thank you so much for for these questions. I will I will try to give a response. When we talk about borders, of course, we need to talk about what borders are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, <clears throat> these modern borders, which are concrete and uh, not moving? These ones are colonial, but always people marked, this is my land, this is my white. So there were, they, they were, they were so many borders before, but these ones which created 55 states, they were born in Berlin in 1884, 1885. So they are really, they have a colonial origin. Uh, even the idea that people are organized into nation states, it's a modernist political modernity a product a prior to colonial rule with so many forms of authority a, which did not amount to a nation state. So there they is indeed a, the imprint of colonialism in, in these conceptions of nation state, in these conceptions of, of solid borders, which, which, which you, cannot, you cannot cross. Achil Mbembe always speak about the three features of pre-colonial Africa, and he says, the first one is plurality. And he says the second one is mobility. People always moved because there were no concrete reporters. And then he says the third one is compositionality. For instance, today, a stranger is a stranger. There's an insiders and outsiders. And his argument is that in pre-colonial Africa, there was this generous way of making a stranger part of the, the host nation but with the radical difference which comes from colonialism. If you're a stranger, you become a stranger permanently. And that sometimes our identities also become rigidified through law, as well as through the, the identity cards. You can no longer change. If, if, if they say you are this, you become, if you are Tutsi, you will carry that. And if you are Hutu, you carry that. And that creates a lot of problems. So that would be my, 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 <clears throat> my response to that one. Then the second one of, uh, of uh, decolonization uh, becoming a metaphor. Of course, we are always very, very cautious about making decolonization a metaphor. But uh, from my work, my own work, I see decolonization as a liberatory <clears throat> a movement. And I see it addressing existential questions, not metaphorical questions. So I, I really, when I think about decolonization, I'm thinking deeply about coloniality of being, whereby human beings are hierarchized uh, racially to the extent that those at the top of the invented social pyramid have higher chances of life. And those who are at the bottom, they have their life is 
is actually what 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 is the term dispensable. And, and when we're talking about that, we're not talking about metaphors here, we're talking about a life and a death uh, issue. And, and I, think, I think it is important to, to think that way. And also when we think about the questions of opulency and the, the questions of poverty, the zones of poverty and the zones of opulence, again, those were not made by God. They were actually made by a political system which is connected to colonialism and racial capitalism. And when we think about issues like, why is it that it is people of color who are doing menial jobs at a planetary scale? And that again was not made by God, it's a system of power which actually was created, which created those, that, that type, of, that type of, uh, of other people being subjected to exploit exploitation of their labor and that they own nothing and they were dispossessed in order for them to then sell their labor cheaply like that. So I don't see, I don't approach decolonization as, as, as a metaphor. Uh, I, I, I really link it with the existential, very empirical ways of life, which needs to change. And uh, I remember a, a very good uh, scholar in, uh, in decolonial uh, and post-colonial thought, Kuminda Bambra, speaking about the issues of the welfare systems in the global north. And saying the welfare systems in the, in the global north are a product of warfare somewhere. So you will need really to understand that those histories. So it's, it's, it's really an important movement of really rewriting history from those who have been victimized by the system. And we need not to buy into the history as written by those who are beneficiaries of the system. And if we, 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 we fall into that trap, the decolonial project is actually talking about how do we see the world from where we are? Uh, particularly those who were victim, victimized by the system. And they were writing a history from that perspective, who are not metaphorizing anything. <clears throat> then in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, international development, uh, it is interesting that you raised that question because two weeks ago, I was invited by, the <clears throat> by Christian, Christian Aid UK to give uh, a seminar on, uh, on how can decolonization assist in development and the humanitarian aid, a humanitarian work. So again, we began to talk about, you will need to deal with the structures. You need to understand the system which generates, which creates some people as recipients of aid. How did some people become recipients of aid? in the first instant. We can't normalize that. We need to historicize it. And how did they come to be, to be charitable people, people waiting for charity from some. And it then links with my argument, which I actually picked from Kuminda Pambra of the welfare system and the, and the, and the, the warfare somewhere, which actually leads to the other development of that, those areas. And then these people now then who are coming from the good welfare, strong welfare systems coming now as, 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 as development uh, assistant or as, as missionaries trying to help the poor, but at the same time, they are not challenging the system. So I went uh, to the extent of coming back to the question of coloniality of being, coloniality of knowledge, and I, I, I went with them through that so that they understand that this condition cannot be changed by giving uh, packages or parcels or something like that we will need to mobilize to change the system itself. And unless we change the system itself, the efforts at trying to develop the global South, all of them failed. Not because the people of the global South are not trying, they've been trying, but the system does not allow that. The system operates, its operational logic is uneven development with other parts of the world really providing the raw materials and the other parts of the world providing the finished products. But being in charge, this is what, what uh, Walter Rodney uh, called the double, the double bind. They are in charge of the prices of the finished product as well as the raw materials which come from there. So they doubly benefit from the system. So it is that system of racial capitalism which we need to deal with. And, and if we don't confront it that way and become honest about it, that is a power structure, is a modern power structure which under and, uh, and uh, develop other parts of the world while developing the other parts of the world. And that is 
constitutive of its logic is not an accident, is not an apparition, is how it operates. And this is why when, when people like Nkrumah and the others, they came to power, one of the things they were demanding was called the demand for a new international economic order, whereby they realized that as long as it is hierarchical like what it is, with the United States, uh, with this, uh, it's, uh, it's NATO and the others on the top, echelons and the others on the below, development would be impossible. And that did not succeed. But in the 60s and 70s, that was a major, a major demand. And there was even a demand that development becomes a right. And those people were not made to think that way. They were realizing that it is being denied. And if it is made a right at the United Nations level, then perhaps it will be allowed. We will allow the global South to, to develop. Of course, people will run and they say, uh, you know, this comparison, uh, the, the GDP of Ghana in 1957 was similar to the GDP of Singapore and uh, uh, South Korea. They will always give you that, 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 that. But the issue is during the Cold War, some parts of the world were allowed to develop, others were disabled from development. This is why Nkrumah was removed from power when he was trying to develop that, that part of, 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 of Ghana. He had a grand plans about the Volta Dam and all this. And what happened? He removed him from power. So that there they were disabled. In other parts, they were enabled for Cold War ideological purposes. So that also we need to take into account. We can't just compare as though there were no politics, there were no ideologies, <laughs> there was nothing. We can't do that. If we do that, we are actually embarking in very lazy analysis of just comparing as though there are, there are no other forces at play. What happened in, in the DRC, which makes it as poor as it is? What happened to the first prime minister of the DRC, Patrick uh, Lumumba? Immediately, he, he gave his inaugural speech as prime minister that the resources of, of that country will belong to the people. He was a dangerous person and he never lasted and they killed him. What happened to Thomas Sankara, who was trying to change Burkina Faso? They, they, they removed physically. And they, what happened to Mema Gaddafi? They removed him physically. So, so the issue is you try to change things which actually affect the system. They come for you straight away. And those who have staying power, most of them are useless leaders who just play to the gallery and, and, and everything. Those who really want to change things, they don't last. And we need to be honest about that. So we, um, I don't see any question. Uh, Iman, may I ask a question? Yes, please. So, I mean, I have a question. Um, so you talk about thinking about that we need to think of decolonization on a planetary scale. It should be mm -hmm. a planetary project. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have two questions here. So first, what does a planetary decolonization movement look like? Mm -hmm. But also I would like to bring in um, the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Um, two things that are weighing in my mind right now. So there is the question of Palestine, what's going on, what's going right now, right, mm -hmm. in Palestine, and mm -hmm. the difficulties that we've been having for a long time to mm -hmm. make it legible as colonization, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is also another development going on in the northern region of Ethiopia with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Tigray, and also the mm -hmm. difficulty to make that also legible, mm -hmm. right, or intelligible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, as, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, as colonization and a need for decolonization. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if uh, mm -hmm. I was able to connect the dots. Yes, yes, so yes, I get, I get, I get. It was exactly. important to address Palestine. I get, I get, I get exactly what, what you are talking about. And indeed, you are raising very, very important question. And let me start maybe with the last set of your your interventions, mm -hmm. particularly about Ethiopia, uh, <clears throat> Palestine, and, and the others. Mm -hmm. There, again, we need to do a proper analysis. Mm -hmm. And they, I've been reading the latest book by Mahmoud Mamdani on, uh, <clears throat> on this question of the nation state. Because the nation state, as we said, is born of colonialism. And they, it was meant to solve other issues of then, but it creates other issues today. So the, it's, it's, it's now another escalation of our analysis to say, 
the idea of a nation state, is it a solution to problems or it creates more problems? And I think it is creating more problems because if you read Mamdani correctly, you will understand that he says, if ever is a nation state, who is the nation? And they, it can't be all of us. They, they need to be they need to be a dominant ethnic, as uh, uh, Anthony D. Smith will say, a dominant ethnic around which the nation crystallizes and the others are minoritized. And it is from those minoritized who will resist, who will want to be minoritized. Minoritized means you are disempowered. You are excluded in so many other things. And the issue is, can we rethink political modernity? That is, that is, that is one major task. And that means rethinking political community, how it is organized. And secondly, it fundamentally means also that should we not rethink from nation state to citizen state, for instance, so that the issue is not to make the nation and the state contaminous. You can have a single state with many nations under it. And the, the state becomes just an organizing, a political organizing apparatus, which actually using law, they need to put you the, 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 all the nations at the same level. And that, that, is, that is what we talk about reconstituting the political itself. But that is a very difficult thing to do for modern people like me and you, because we are born of this ideology that the best form of organizing is a nation state. And this is why you will find a person like Mahmoud Mamdani saying, why is it that when I read the post-colonial African problems, they read like the pre-modern of Europe? When, when, when you read the post-colonial problems, the, the Rwandan genocide and all that, they, they read like, what was happening in Europe in the past. And it means therefore we need to rewrite, to, to revisit the history of political modernity, to see what is it that colonialism carried from Europe into where it, 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 it migrated to, where it moved to. And when it then moves out, when the administrative colonialism is pushed out or dismantled, then all these problems come to the surface. And these problems, which manifest themselves exactly in accordance with the paradigm of difference. And that paradigm of difference has been a central aspect of, politi of political modernity in Europe. So there is, there is really a lot of work to be done in rethinking uh, this decolonization is not an easy work. It means there is a lot of rethinking of the epistemological basis of things. And uh, when I wrote that book on on the epistemic freedom in Africa, I was always saying perhaps a lot of problems which manifest as institutional, systemic, have roots in the epistemic. And they, I'm, still, I'm still trying to push that argument that they might have a root in the epistemic. So, and, they, and they, I was happy when I read Mamdani when he was saying we need an epistemic revolution in order to, do, to redo the political. If you have no epistemological revolution, you won't redo the political. And I, then I was also uh, given confidence when I read Nelson Matonato Torres saying, what appears as revolutions, sometimes it actually reproduces the same problems it was trying to fight against because of weak epistemological basis of, that re of those revolutions. So that's when I then said, it means it's an explo uh, explosible thesis that we needed to go to the epistemic base of things. And then when I read uh, Walter Mignolo and uh, Catherine Walsh on, on, on decoloniality, and they say, epistemology frames ontology. In other words, knowledge creates reality. Then I said, here, here I am. It means I was right. <laughs> it means I was right. We will need to really go through that route and perhaps we can actually change things. And then when it comes to the planetary, we started with, uh, with Eman about that planetary when I was saying, but let's go back to what was colonialism. Colonialism was a planetary problem. And they said it was planetary in the sense that 
if we follow Bembe's logic, Bembe says the colonialists wanted to claim the whole earth as their own and they control it. And therefore, it means you cannot fight such a planetary problem using national solutions. And I think, I think this is where I'm bringing in the, the issue of the, of, of the planetary. But we are asking, how do we do it? The issue is we need to mobilize at a planetary scale. And I think we had begun to do that from the time of Marcus Garvey, from the time of, uh, of, of W.E.P. Dubois. We're already beginning when we're talking about uh, black consciousness, when we're talking about Pan-Africanism, we're beginning to say the black people at a planetary scale need to be mobilized because they are actually subjected to a particular racial power. And now, during our time, the Black Lives Matter movements, they are beginning also to, to, to mobilize at a planetary scale. And that is the way you can actually deal with this problem. Because if, if we deal with it as pockets, Ethiopians there, we, we are creating an impression that it is a problem of Ethiopia, <laughs> when, when it basically it is a problem of a planetary power structure, which is not coming from a god, but constructed by a particular civilization. Mm -hmm. So we will need really to think about it that way. That, that, that would be my modest response to that one. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I think we are about to wrap, Eman, right? Um, and we'll be kicked out of the, um, <laughs> the room. Uh, sure. you, know, uh, you know, very soon. Sure. So, sure. Iman, I don't know if you wanted to say something before we close. Um, I mean, we, I guess we do need more time for the kind of <laughs> questions I had in mind, but maybe for our um, audience, especially since a lot of them are students, if we could explain why, you know, so they would have heard global and mm. world, and now they're introduced to planetary. So yeah, yeah. if we can just give them a little bit of background for the concepts. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, I was running away from the term global deliberate. And, and global there's reasons, right? So <laughs> the audience doesn't know the background. Yeah, because uh, uh, the global is actually a depoliticization of a political agenda. I, I find it to be really deep depoliticization, depoliticizing. That's and that's why I, I wanted to avoid using it because it globally creates an impression that just the, the world are collapsing into each other naturally like that. That there is no racial capitalism as an animating spirit in this in this in this globalization. So globalization is really also creating a one world. This is what I did not like also to, to think about the issue of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a universal. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always for a pluriversal in which differences don't need to collapse. They need to be there, but they must not be vectors of exclusion and inclusion. So that, 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 is, that is how I was avoiding to use the, the terms given by colonialism itself. So we needed to use other terms as part of pushing this this issue of decolonization, so I I prefer planetary to 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 globalization. So I think we'll start saying our goodbyes to our guests and you know to our audiences. Um, thank you again uh, for attending um, this conversation between our two scholars Sabelo and uh, Iman. Uh, that was very powerful and I'm sure our students got a lot uh, out of it, a lot of takeaways, uh, takeaways out of it. Thank you also for the great questions. I think this is just the beginning of a conversation. Mm -hmm. And as I said, Sabelo, mm -hmm. and, I, and I look forward in the Dickey Center uh, to bringing you um, to Dartmouth when we are face to face and putting you also in conversation with a number of uh, our colleagues who are also thinking about uh, yeah, decolonization yeah. on a planetary um, mm. scale. Uh, true, true. Thank you again. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ayo. Thank you, Eman. It was great to to engage with you. Hope hope this this actually I gave something. <laughs> oh yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. <laughs>